big difference between the mark of the beast and I am thine, O Lord. And I've, I've always uh, wondered about the, you know, we don't think there's anything special about Christians. We understand what that is. But I am thine, O Lord, and the mark of the beast is what showed the ownership of the beast over people. And so you got to wonder if there was some psychology behind them assigning that number to that particular song in that songbook. At any rate, uh, I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, my, my brother's wife and uh, my nephew's fiance arrived in uh, uh, Minnesota today at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, to be with my nephew as he has his surgery tomorrow. Um, he's, he's very um, much wanting to move forward uh, with, the, with the situation. They are, um, uh, when I talked to my mom today for Mother's Day, um, sh she's having a real hard time with it. That's her grandson. Said I just you know hate to to see him um, handicapped to to that extent. He's 21 years old. Um, I said he's already handicapped to a great extent with a dead arm hanging off his shoulder. I said he'll be less handicapped without that extra weight pulling off on his shoulder and on his neck and on his back. He goes I know that, but I just hate to see him without what he came into the world with. And, and I can understand her perspective, but he, my nephew doesn't see it that way. My nephew sees this as a new lease on life. He's had an incredible attitude through the whole process. And as a part of this process, the Mayo Clinic, if, you, if, if you're not familiar with them, you need to familiarize yourself with them. If you are familiar with them, you know that they are some of the best experts medically in the, on the planet dealing with a lot of very specialty issues as well as common issues. And as a part of the consultation that he went through, his team of surgeons that did all of his um, restorative surgeries to try to uh, reappropriate the use of his arm, uh, were meeting with the amputation team to explain everything that they did so that everything could be um, done in a, in a, a proper manner. They're going to leave the, the stump at the upper part of the arm because the muscle they grafted at the top is still active that they pulled from his leg. And they're going to wrap it around the stump so that when a prosthetic is available, he's going to be able to use it. He's going to be able to fire it off. Um, but they, they sent him through all these different teams, and they, um, they put him through counseling. And the, the counselors came out absolutely amazed that this 21-year-old was wanting to do this, wanting it out of the way, and wanting it done for all the right reasons. That he was, they said he's, if <laughs> they were, they thought it was funny because uh, they would like to see everybody come in there with the same attitude that he had. But it's a, uh, he's, he's three, almost three and a half years past his accident. It's time. Um, not going to get any better. So he's, um, if everything goes well tomorrow, he'll go home Tuesday. He'll fly back to Tallahassee on Tuesday. And uh, it's a six week recovery period. He's getting married uh, the 15th, I think it is, 15th of July. Uh, he and his sister are getting married six weeks apart from each other. I think they did that just to torture their parents. Uh, but it's a, uh, and, and now you throw in this situation. My brother has really struggled through this, and um, he, uh, he he's told me on more than one occasion that his uh, his son has actually uh, strengthened him. He should have been there for his son, and he said, my son's been there for me. So uh, his, his son's a pretty special young man. And appreciate your prayers, um, and would covet your prayers tomorrow, especially as the surgeons are uh, going through their procedures with, uh, with my nephew. Would you pray with me, please? Our Holy Father, you are a great and awesome God, and we know that your capability knows no limit. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for the blessings of this life and the incredible things that you've done for us. 
We pray, Father, that as we once again immerse ourselves in your word, that you would bless us to see another portion of you in these lines of scripture, that we may come to know you better and come to know ourselves better, that we could be better prepared, Father, to be your servants here and be better prepared to be with you in eternity. Thank you for the time we share. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the comfort or through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Those things written before that the Apostle Paul addresses to the Roman Christians, of course, are our Old Testament. And as we've been surveying these books, uh, beginning with Genesis and working our way towards the New Testament, we want to be reminded of those things because uh, there are a few books in the Old Testament that, you know, we, we kind of scratch our head. Uh, there's one that's coming up, the Song of Solomon is a book that we don't preach a lot out of the Song of Solomon. Um, and, and I will tell you, the Song of Solomon is very explicit. Uh, Jewish men during the time of Jesus were not permitted to read it until they were 30 years old. 30 years old. It, it's very explicit. We wonder why is it there? Well, it shows the beautiful relationship, the physical aspect of the beautiful relationship of marriage and shows how that is is supposed to be in its idyllic state. Um, it's in the Bible. And um, it's a um, it's, it's an oft difficult to understand uh, book. Job is one of those books. Job, we look at Job and, and it's just this long, drawn out bunch of conversations and we can't really figure anything out. Why in the world did God do this to this man? Well, when you stop and you pay attention to the book itself, you can see that this book right here is central to everything that we are while we're on earth. It's central to that. It provides us some grounding and perspective on our life. We do not know the, the date or the author of this writing, but the uh, events that are found within the book of Job appear to be pre-Mosaic. In other words, before Moses. Because Moses ended the patriarchal age with his presence. And so Job, as you look in chapter 1, Job is offering sacrifices for his family. He was the high priest for his family. Therefore, he lived during the patriarchal time. There are some who even... Uh, conjecture and there's no evidence one way or the other that he lived before the flood don't know but it was during the time when men served as the high priest over their families and so the dates of the events uh, predate Moses Job lived before Moses did and we have uh, many who say that that this book was written before the Pentateuch and others that put it at varying times throughout the history of God's people before Jesus came. So there's no consensus on the date of it, only consensus as we look at the details as to what, when the events took place within this book. The purpose of the book of Job is, is really not that complicated. It illustrates God's absolute sovereignty over the affairs of this world and consequently it seeks to elicit our trust, especially and even during times of suffering. Job makes a statement, though he slay me, I will trust him. That's one of the most sobering statements in all the Bible. Because we all suffer to a certain extent. We, we all have experienced suffering, and if we live much longer, we're going to experience suffering again. And during those times, do we turn to God or do we turn away from God? That's what the book of Job's all about. I'm going to present you the outline of the book of Job, but then I'm going to present the overview of Job in a very different way. 
the outline, the, the prologue, or the first uh, two chapters. In these uh, uh, two chapters, we get an idea about this man, Job, about what type of person he was, and about what led to the difficulties in his life. We see dialogue taking place between Job and his friends in chapters 3 through 27, a uh, dialogue that was uh, not very pleasant at times. We see uh, a hymn on wisdom. That's chapter 28. We hear Job's oration in chapters 29, 30, and 31. Elihu's speeches in 32 through 37. Then we hear the sovereign Lord's speeches in 38 through 42 and verse 6. And then we are brought to the epilogue in the closing verses of chapter 42. It is a lengthy book. Our young people, I, I'm going to tell you something. Ruth, piece of cake. Esther, piece of cake. Job, you have my sincere respect for Bible Bowl and Job. And answering the questions like you guys did during Bible Bowl uh, and doing as well as you did, phenomenal. Uh, you, you put many, many adults to shame by what you learn in such a short period of time. Take the things that you learn from Job and hang on to them because you're going to need them. I'm going to tell you, you're going to need them through your life. Okay, I want to present Job to you in scenes because it presents itself in scenes, almost like a play. And so we, we open up to this scene, and then we come to this scene, and then we come to this scene. And that's how I'm going to present the overview of the book of Job to you because we're going to... Uh, just get some insight into what's taking place here. In scene one, we've got a picture of Job and his family. He had an amazing family, had amazing possessions, um, and we see exactly how great things were prior to the time of affliction that overcame the family. In scene two, Satan enters into the divine presence and accuses God. The words Satan and devil mean accuser and adversary. And that's exactly who Satan is. He accuses God. Does, does Job serve you for nothing? What is Satan doing? He's accusing God. He's accusing God. I, I don't know what happens now, and I can't tell you because we are not given insight. I cannot tell you exactly how Satan appears in the presence of God. I don't know how that happens. I don't know uh, if there's a distance, if there's some kind of filter, since God can't be in the presence of sin. We don't know how that happens, but the conversation takes place. And I believe with all my heart that that conversation is still going on today. I really do. I believe that conversation, I believe he continues to accuse God, and I believe that God continues to put him on a leash and allows him from time to time to bring things into our life. Difficulties sometimes. I think that still happens today. It would explain a lot in this world, wouldn't it? It would explain a lot. I know we are born into a world uh, that is scarred by sin, where sin is present, but the prince of the darkness of the air is the king of this world. He is. He, he rules over this, the, the principalities and the powers and the darkness. Satan enters into the presence of God and accuses God he is permitted to afflict Job's family and his possessions, but he's not allowed to touch the man. And at the end of scene two, we see that Job maintains his integrity before God. I, 
I really don't know how he kept it together. Scene three. Satan re-enters the divine presence and once again accuses God. Does he serve you for nothing? Think about this for just a moment. God let him have at Job, his possessions, his family. The only thing surviving was his wife and the servants that came to bring him the news. He lost everything else. But he had his help. He had his help. Then Satan, and Satan was probably very proud of himself. Then what happened? Satan goes back before God, once again accuses God. And this time he's permitted to uh, afflict Job's health, but he is not permitted to take his life. There's comfort in those words. And you might look at me and go, how can that possibly be comforting? Because Satan cannot do anything more than God will permit. He cannot do more. You know, we, we often think, and, and I use this example a lot because I grew up with cartoons, okay? And you remember the guy with the cartoon angel on one shoulder and the cartoon devil on the other, and they're both talking in his ear trying to get him to either do good or do bad? As if those two are, are equals, and that carries over into our adulthood where we think that God and Satan are equals who are in war, at war with each other. Folks, Satan is a created being. He was not created evil. He was created good like all things that were created. But because of his pride, he fell. He rebelled in the very presence of God. And several of the angels decided to take his side. And they were all cast out. Satan has no power over God whatsoever. If you can't take comfort and refuge in that, there is no comfort to be found in the Scriptures. There is not a war of equals. It's not like the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States where mutually assured destruction was pointed at one another. There's nothing like that. Satan, with a whisper from God, would disappear for all time. Should that be God's will? Now, we know it's God's will that in the end that Satan and his angels are cast into the bottomless pit. But until then, Satan is on a short leash. He's on a short leash. We can take comfort in that. He could attack Satan's physical health, but he could not take his life. And therefore, Job is set about with boils from his head to the bottom of his feet. Job continues to retain his integrity. I would not dare preach a Mother's Day sermon on Job's wife. One of the most horrible things I think anybody in all of Scripture ever said was what she said to her husband at the loss of everything that he had except for her. And about the time she said it, he's probably wishing that she had gone the way of the whirlwind. When she says, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, we, when we get to the back end, we see the blessings that God brings back into his life. We don't know if it's from the same wife or if something along the line, if she, if she was there or not. We assume it was the same wife. But we're not told. We don't know if there was um, maybe someone with a little bit more integrity than her or maybe if she came to her senses at some point in time. We don't know, but his blessings were greater on the back end than they were at the beginning. But at this point in time, she did not handle those circumstances very well at all. Why don't you just curse God and die? Job's response to me is one of the most powerful things. Shall we, not, what, shall we accept good from God and not evil? You know, what God permits to come into our life many times is bad. But we want to talk about that on the back end and the importance of that. But we, 
We need to be consistent and we need to be men and women of integrity who trust in God regardless of the circumstances. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a verse right there that we could all commit to memory and do well in doing so. Scene four comes before us, and we have the arrival of Job's three friends. And they come there to comfort him, and they sit in silence for seven days. And those are probably the best seven days of their relationship with Job, from Job's perspective, because once the silence breaks, it's not nearly as much fun for Job. Scene five, Job's patience was exhausted, and he utters a complaint. Scene six, we see these long and fruitless discussions between Job and his three friends. They insisted that the suffering that he endured was the result of a personal sin in his life. Now, when you think about that, it takes us all the way to John chapter 9, doesn't it? Lord, tell us, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They had so convinced themselves through, over the course of time that sin was directly responsible for every problem that came into our life, that it had to be directly related to the person, and that's just not the case. A young mother and her children driving home, and a drunk driver crosses the road and kills them, had nothing to do with her sin. It had to do with the sin of another. There are many such circumstances. A young child, a two-year-old child getting leukemia, has nothing to do with that child's sin. And, and I think we're at a place in our, in our faith and, and our understanding from what Jesus taught us, that we don't assign those types of things. Yes, there are consequences to our sins, and yes, sometimes bad things happen to bad people because they did bad things. Yes, but just because something bad happens does not necessarily mean that is a direct result of a sin in a person's life. These friends had this, uh, what is known in the uh, scholarship circles as retributive theology, where there's uh, retribution, from God for the sin that you've committed in your life. Job defends his innocence throughout. He says, there's not, there's not a personal sin. I'm not hiding some kind of sin. There's nothing there. And then Elihu enters the discussion in scene seven. His conversation went on and on and on. Scene eight. Now we have the main character, not only of Job, but of the Bible, deciding to make his presence felt. And the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind. And through his answer, he enlightens and he reproves Job. The Lord talked to, to Job a couple of times, and, and the fact that the Lord answered once again gives us additional information that this is a patriarchal situation. Uh, as God speaks to the heads of households. There are answers without answers from God. Tell you what, you question me, you answer my questions, I'll give you your answer. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you? And he goes on, and, and, and th these questions have no answer from a human perspective. We cannot answer him, even to this day. Because where were we before we were created? We have no idea where we were when God laid the foundation of the world. We don't know. All we know is what the prophet Isaiah returns to us from the Lord with his ways 
are much higher than our ways. We just don't know. He begins discussing creating uh, the behemoth. And as you look at the description of a behemoth, it can't be anything but a very large dinosaur. There are uh, liberal theo theologians who want to describe uh, or, or interpret behemoth as uh, an elephant or a hippopotamus. The biggest problem with that is elephants and hippopotami have the worst tails on earth. And the tail that is described on the behemoth is like a cedar tree. And this little piece of twine that hangs off the back end of a hippopotamus or off of an elephant is only good for swatting a few flies off the rear end. That's about all it's good for. It does not look like a cedar tree. And so there are other aspects of the description of them that does not fit those animals. <clears throat> this is more evidence to the fact that dinosaurs and humans coexisted side by side because Job knew exactly the animal that's being described to him, or else it would have made no sense. Then there is the Leviathan that is described. And Le Leviathan is a fire-breathing dragon. Look at the description. A fire-breathing dragon. You know, there are legends that have come down to us for thousands of years, and we think of them as only being myths because we can't see it happen today. We think that it never existed. And yet there it is described in the pages of Scripture. Apparently a formidable beast. In scene 9, Job confesses that he questioned without knowledge. He once again showed his integrity. Instead of arguing with God, he recognized the folly of what he had done. In scene 10, the Lord speaks a second time. Job's second confession is made. The Lord rebukes the three friends for their foolish words. There's a command for them to sacrifice. And at the conclusion in scene 12, we see Job praying for his friends. Do you know that Job was not only a high priest for his family, he served as high priest for his friends. He, he, he was the go-between between his foolish friends that had caused him additional pain on top of his already existing pain. And he petitions God on their behalf. <clears throat> his prosperity is restored. And the Lord blessed the latter part of his life greater than he had been blessed before. Now, we need not look at that and, and think that there is going to be uh, this very same thing happening to us simply because we are men and women of integrity. We have no idea what God's plans are for us. If God decides to prosper us materially, then praise God. If he doesn't prosper us materially, we need to praise God. But we know that our prosperity in a spiritual sense is much greater at the end than it will ever be at the beginning. And then Job dies of old age. He was full of days. And this is the one piece of evidence, I think, that is strong that this is a post-Diluvian patriarch because uh, he did not live to be 900 years as the pre-Diluvian patriarchs lived. And to say that he was old and full of age at 170-some-odd years, then uh, that's more in line with Abraham and his, line, uh, his age than it is uh, so he probably is after Noah before Moses that probably gives us a good bracket there but he he saw children to the fourth generation and what a great blessing that was for him now I want to talk to you about 
the purpose for the book of Job and what it means to us today. We, well, you know, God's not going to come to us and have this conversation. And I think we foolishly sometimes remark that God doesn't work that way anymore. And we say those things to things we have no evidence one way or the other if he works that way or not. We know that the uh, spiritual gifts of the first century church, God doesn't work that way anymore. We know that to be the fact. But when we see this conversation between Satan and God and the interaction that is taking place there, we have no evidence whatsoever that that doesn't continue. No evidence whatsoever. And so we, we need to be careful about speaking dogmatically about it does or it doesn't. But what we do know is that suffering exists today. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, James, that's easy for you to say. Count it all joy when we fall into various trials. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, there is joy to be found in that statement. No matter how sad his heart was, there is joy that he can find. Because he's blessing the Lord and recognizing the Lord's sovereignty over those circumstances. We, too, like our great-great-great-great-grandfather in the faith, Job, all those years ago, we need to find place for suffering in our lives, and we need to see it in its proper state. Various trials. Now, these trials that James describes here are not pleasant experiences. They're difficulties that come into our lives. And he tells us that the testing of our faith produces patience. There's a beautiful thing that takes place when, when our, we see that through God's help we can endure. You know what that does for us? It strengthens our faith. It strengthens our faith. Now, I don't know how many of you go to the gym and... Uh, and I guess if we're going to see him, we have to go to him tonight. Uh, just seeing if uh, there's three people paying attention to me down there. Uh, but I don't know how many, maybe you've got a workout bench or you've got a treadmill at home or you've got something. But the only way that muscle grows and strengthens is for it to be put to a trial. That's the only way that muscle can work. And it's not an easy process. Whether lifting weights, whether doing isometric, whether doing yoga, where whatever type of workout a person seeks to do, whether you just get on the treadmill for 30 minutes a day, you ride a, a stationary bike, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, there is a trial involved for you to become better and stronger. And, and more fit. There's a trial that's involved. Paul writes to the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 5 regarding suffering and difficulties. He says, verses 3 through 5, And not only that, but we glory in tribulations. Now let's stop right there. What in the world is Paul talking about? Glory in tribulations. Who in their right mind would glory in a tribulation? And why would he say such a thing? For the very same reason that James says, consider it pure joy. Consider it joy when you fall into various trials. Because he says, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope now hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out in our hearts by the holy spirit who is given to us 
Look at the progression. Tribulation, perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And that hope does not disappoint. In the very same way that a child has to learn to crawl before it can walk, it has to learn to walk before it can run. The same is true of our faith. We have to endure difficulties just as Job did. We have to learn to endure. And we have to learn to say, no matter what the circumstances are, blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's hard. That is hard. If it was easy, anybody could do it. But it is a period of growth that takes place in our lives. And I, I'm convinced that that period of growth does not end until we die. I think that there's growth that takes place all the way through our lives. And that character, that Christian character that is produced in our lives is something that not only benefits us and others in this age, but we carry that with us into the eternal age. And it is that character by which we will be known in eternity on how we've persevered and how we've overcome. God permits suffering in his divine plan. I believe Job teaches this as a means of perfecting character. He permits it. I don't believe God causes. I think that we, we need to look at two types of things in God's will. His causative will and his permissive will. I don't believe God causes the three-year-old to get run over by a bus. But he permits it. And I'm not going to judge God for that. I'm not going to judge him for that. Many people will judge him over those types of things. I'm not going to judge him by what he permits. God sent his son into the world to die for us. That's God's causative will. But the difficulties that come into our life, the difficulties that came into Job's life, God did not cause those difficulties. He only permitted them. But it was still according to his will because it only could be done in a particular way according to his will. So I believe that when we come to the end and we look at what James says, we look at what Paul says to the Roman Christians, that God permits suffering as a part of his divine plan, as a means of perfecting our character, making it strong, making it mature. You know who the best person in the world to talk to someone who's lost a child is? Someone who's lost a child. Our friend that you have met, uh, Angie, who has been here twice, uh, lost her husband when we were in Gulf Shores, Alabama, 2005, Easter weekend. It was on Friday, Easter weekend. And she struggled for a long, long time. Over the course of the last few years, I have actually put her in touch with women who had lost their husbands as someone who could actually have a conversation with them on a, beyond a theoretical level. And she has done wonders. No training, but just talking about her experience, talking about where she is versus where she was, all of these kinds of things. And I have tried to do that many times. Our friend Eileen in uh, Guyana, Ahmet and Eileen, the, the couple who... I spent a great deal of time with strong workers in the church there. Lost their six-year-old son. Coming up this June, it will be uh, two years since they lost their son. Or is it three years? It's three years. Three years. After they lost their son, I put a lady in our congregation in Franklin who had four sons. She went out of order, but she had Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John David. 
all right? She went out of order. But her second son, Matthew, committed suicide when he was 16 years old. He, ha- he suffered from severe depression. They went to church one morning, and they came home, and he shot him. That was, I guess that's close to 20 years ago now. But when her son died, their only child, I asked her if she would contact her. And she was willing to do that. And they have struck up a wonderful friendship. Because she's been there, she's lost a child. Different circumstances, but the loss of a child nonetheless. And God allows us to experience things. I I do not know the why. Brother John and I were having the why conversation earlier tonight. I do not know why God saw fit that my parents separated and my family was destroyed when I was 14 years old. I do not know why, but I know some of the things that have come out of that that I have been able to talk to a lot of people who have been through the same thing. And speak from a position that is other than reading something out of a book. The circumstances that you're going through now may be to prepare you for helping someone else in the future. And that's a beautiful thing because guess what that shows you? It shows you how much God trusts you to give you as a caretaker of those experiences in life and store those things up to be used to help others overcome the difficulties that they may face in the future. Why? There's no good answer to why to so many things with God. And if he told us why, you know, we probably couldn't understand it. And you know, Brother John says, you know, when I when I get there, and I, I've said this before myself, brother, when I get there, I've got a long list of questions I've got to ask God. And you know, over the course of time, I, I still have those questions, but but I, I'm starting to come to the, the belief that, that when I get there, you know, uh, I'm... I'm not going to care. If I'm in the presence of God, I'm not even going to care about those questions anymore. Amen. Amen. But for the time being, we can't help. We're human beings. We ask why. We ask why. Job is a beautiful story to help us with the why. Because in the end, when Job died... We have no evidence that God ever told him why, even though we get the 2020 and get to see why it happened. We don't believe he ever found out. And I don't know that it ever mattered to him because he continued to praise God, as we should as well. Job is such an amazing book. Once again, Our young people, you have my highest respect for studying that book because that's a difficult book to study. It's for an adult, much less for uh, someone that hasn't even made it into their teenage years. That's a difficult book. But keep studying it because you're going to continue to learn and to grow from that book. Adults, likewise. We still have much to learn from the book of Job. I don't know what's going on in your life tonight. I don't know if uh, Satan has been uh, tormenting you, whether through your health, through your relationships, through your possessions, through your job, through any other circumstance that you may have in your life. But I do know one thing. I know that my Redeemer lives. Isn't that right, Brother Gene? I know my Redeemer lives. And I also know that we should have the same attitude that Job had, though he slay me, I will trust him. Can we help you with that tonight? Do you have something specific? Can we pray with you and pray for you and encourage you in some way tonight uh, to, to continue to grow, to stay strong, to stay faithful?
regardless of the circumstances in your life. Or if you're here tonight and you've not obeyed the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ, you've never put on Christ in baptism, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, can we help you with that tonight as well? Whatever your need is, we're about to sing this song. Won't you come as together we stand and as we sing?